everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, Tips and Traps for Conveyancing in Lockdown. My name is Stephen Smith. I'm the Country Manager at Stuart Title Limited, uh, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Ian Quayle, who will be leading today's Hi, session. Hi, Ian. How are you? Very well, thank you. Very well indeed. So, uh, He's good. looking forward uh, to doing the good. Oh, apologize. Sorry, Ian. Just just saying, I'm looking forward to the, the uh, delivering the presentation. So uh, absolutely. Um, just a brief introduction. Ian qualified as a solicitor and worked in private practice for 12 years. Uh, he specialised in property uh, law, um, including residential work, commercial leases, acquisitions, and disposals. Uh, since 1998, uh, Ian has worked in house as a consultant for national house builders and national international property developers. Uh, and he's been advising on all aspects of property, landlord and tenant transactional and management issues. Um, Ian's obviously the trainer today for the last 16 years. Ian has been sort of doing this, providing training to the legal profession. I'm sure a lot of you on the webinar today are familiar with Ian. Uh, Ian's worked some of the most prominent providers of uh, legal training, as well as providing it privately um, to firms and organisations. Uh, this has been in the main provided by in-house courses, public courses and conferences. Uh, obviously, we're doing a webinar today. This is, I think, both for Ian and I and Stuart Title, this is uh, the first time we've done something in, in lockdown like this, uh, sharing the screens remotely, so we'll see how it, it all comes together and works. Um, Ian lives in the northeast of England with his partner and, and travels nationally when, when he's allowed to, anyway, when we're not in lockdown. Ian, it's, uh, uh, in your biography, it says that you uh, renovated a 200-year-old property as part of your hobbies. Uh, yes, Steve. Yeah, you know, you know these grand design programs and all these stuff on TV that you watch, and everyone's laughing and smiling. Well, uh, we've been doing up our house. It hadn't been lived in for 30 years. It's over 200 years old, and it's in an idyllic setting. But uh, there haven't been many smiles. There's been lots of grimaces. And uh, most yeah. evenings, most evenings when I am at home or when I return home. Uh, there's sort of tears over the dinner table and threats to go home to mum, and that's just me. Elaine's far sort of braver than I am, but it's been interesting. And uh, as I say, um, whether I'll do it again, I don't know. I think Elaine's quite keen. I'm not so sure. But thanks, Steve. Yeah, thanks for that introduction. Yes, I've been involved in conveyancing uh, residential, commercial, and indeed development work for many, many years, and do lots of these sorts of presentations, talking about a myriad of different subjects. Um, during the course of today's webinar, there is a, a feature for questions, etc. But also on the last slide of my presentation, to make sure everyone stays awake and no one sort of disappears into the garden, is a, a slide with my email address. So if there's anything that I touch on or mention or anything that you'd like me to explore a little further, then feel free to drop me a note by email and I'll endeavour to assist. As you can imagine, Steve, I've got a little bit of time these days that... Uh, I didn't really uh, plan for, so uh, my turnaround time is significantly better than it used to be for questions or, or queries. Um, so genuinely, you are able to raise questions as we progress. I will loiter, Steve, if I may, at the end of the presentation to deal with any questions that are generated, but I will deal with any questions that uh, you uh, email to me if you're a delegate. Uh, I laugh when I say that because one of the in-house courses I did a presentation for late last year. Um, the next day after I mentioned that if anyone had any questions or queries, they could send me an email. I had uh, over 19 emails. And one of the emails was from someone that wasn't even a delegate at the, um, the event. Uh, they were someone that had been talking to someone who attended uh, at dinner. And they raised a question, which is quite interesting. But genuinely, I'm happy to sort of assist with regard to questions. As Steve said, we're in sort of turbulent times, aren't we? It's quite scary times, to be honest with you, in that uh, when, when I saw the announcement, and, you know, you saw what was coming, you saw, well, you know, th this is sort of hibernation as far as conveyancing is concerned. There's no way in a million years people will be uh, attempting to move property, to, to move house or to deal with uh, transactional work, given the circumstances. As, as sort of things quieten down and as the dust settle, then you are seeing a sort of flow of conveyancing, residential conveyancing, commercial work, essential work that still needs to be done. And the other thing that I notice is there's quite a bit of sort of auction activity, uh, and therefore there is a sort of uh, residual element of resi conveyancing sitting out there, but in very, very difficult times. 
And what I want to do today is to do three things really. One, sort of remind practitioners about some of the fundamentals that are applicable no matter what the circumstances. Two, to look at what we should be doing in connection with lockdown. And um, it is difficult, if not impossible, to gauge or predict what's likely to happen with regard to how long lockdown is likely to last or what's going to happen with regard to the conveyancing market. But I don't know if you, were no if you noticed or read last week, there's some interesting sort of um, articles and presentations where people were saying, well, there's a little bit of sort of mortgage activity, there's a little bit uh, uh, of sort of interest with regard to conveyancing practice, etc. So perhaps it's not all gloom and doom, or perhaps I'm being way too optimistic. The other thing that I read last week is that with regard to a sort of uh, a gradual return to normality, uh, I don't know if you saw, there's an article that was saying estate agents' offices might be one of the first to so, sort of open up. So again, that's quite interesting. But at the moment, to be honest with you, when you speak to members of the profession generally, conveyances in particular, it's tough. Um, so let's start by looking at some basic issues, which I think sort of rise to the fore in the current climate. So if we go and start having a look at some slides, the first thing I want to talk to you about is the fact that this is a series of a number of webinars looking at a number of issues. But today we're looking at current conveyancing issues with regard to lockdown. And the first point I want to make is do not forget the basics. In lockdown, with transactions that are sort of at midpoint or that we're going through or new transactions, it is absolutely imperative in a residential transaction that we identify client objective. Why are you selling? Why are you buying? I was speaking at an event earlier this week and someone, one of the questions that was posed was, I, I think I've got a critical transaction, therefore is it okay for me to uh, proceed with regard to the transaction and what do I do to justify that it's critical? Well, really, th that question is answered by identifying client objective right at the start of the transaction. If we're getting new, new instructions, if we're progressing a transaction and wanting to complete notwithstanding lockdown, is this transaction critical? What's the objective? What's the client's purpose sitting behind it? The client is in temporary accommodation that's grossly unsuitable. There is overcrowding. They are able to ensure that there is proper uh, isolation methods with regard to the conveyancing process and distancing protection there. And therefore, in the client's perspective, this was critical. And therefore, to an extent, the fear and his answer had been answered for him. So identify client objective in any transaction. Why are you selling or why are you buying? The idea as, as to why the client is buying the property or why the client is selling the property will give us some indication as to whether or not the transaction is critical or otherwise. The next point that I think is important is this issue of informed consent. The Law Society's guidance with regard to variation agreements, with regard to deferring completion, highlights a sort of fundamental point that's at the very heart of residential conveyancing. This idea about informed consent. A client can't give consent to an exchange of contract, authorise a deferred com completion, authorise the entering into a variation agreement if they don't understand what they're get, letting themselves in for. And I think, again, in the sort of hint of battle with regard to the conveyancing process at the moment, with all the problems with working from home, problems with regard to IT, problems with regard to communication with clients, it's absolutely essential that we protect ourselves and protect our clients by making sure that clients understand what we're suggesting to them. As far as that is concerned, it sort of, uh, it, it can be developed by the issue of the duty that we have to explain things to our clients. One of the things that Steve didn't mention, but he was very kind in, in, in mentioning and describing what I do, I do quite a lot of work with regard to professional indemnity insurers looking at claims against residential conveyances. And in doing that, one of the things that uh, I look at is this idea about what the courts have said over the years in connection with the duty to explain. So it's absolutely important that clients have the situation explained to them in terms that they can understand or as best we can uh, get them to understand and that they then give us instructions. I think the other thing that we need to do is to set realistic client expectation now more than ever. It's important that clients understand that as far as the conveyancing process is concerned, we're in the hands of others with regard to searches, for example. 
So I was just noticing yesterday that the land registry in Northern Ireland has just closed down, just said, forget it, you know, we're not operational, we're, we're in lockdown. So any searches, anything you want from us, forget about till the, the good times come again. Um, with regard to searches, there are certain local search, uh, local authorities, etc., that are closed down or working on limited resources, and therefore there are delays and issues relating to search results. Again, with regard to communicating with other firms of lawyers, uh, of course, there are situations where lawyers can be off work due to ill health. There can be issues relating to uh, the fact they're not in their office, etc. So we've got to be realistic relating to client expectation. When I mention this, I'm always reminded of a firm I do some consultancy work for in Cardiff. And what they do is they have a list of what can go wrong in residential conveyancing transactions to prevent completion happening. So at exchange of contract, they write to a client and say, we're delighted to tell you that we've exchanged contract today. The parties have contracted to complete on such and such a date. But here's a list of things that could go wrong that could mean completion couldn't take place. Now, I'm not for the life of me saying that we need to do that, but we need, do need to set realistic client expectation. We do need to take instructions from our clients and we do need to make sure that we confirm instructions in writing. And I want to read to you some of the advice given by the Law Society relating to lockdown. And what they say is it's obviously very important to take your clients instructions about how they want to proceed, to advise them as to the risks and benefits and to obtain confirmation from them in writing that they understand the risks and wish to proceed in writing. So there we've got some emphasis from the Law Society that basically just confirms good practice, doesn't it? Mr. Client, this is what the choices are. This is what the risks and benefits are relating to those choices. What would you like to do? And if you then decide, Mr. Client, a particular course of action, then there are risks associated with that. There are benefits associated with that. These are what they are. What I always say to people, because clearly we can act for clients who, you know, can't understand uh, things in the best of times, never mind in the current sort of stressful environment, I would always emphasize to a client in writing, I'll assume you've understood everything that we've said in this email or in this letter, or I'll assume you've understood everything we've said in this telephone conversation, unless you advise me to the contrary. And I'd always ask a client to any if they have any questions or queries with regard to the advice, with regard to the course of action that's been decided, or with regard to the risks or benefits that you've identified and highlighted. I mentioned in the notes and also on slide here, this issue about the duty to explain. There's been quite a bit of case law over recent years concerning this particular point. There is an old case going back to 87 of county personnel against Pulver that you might have seen. There was an interesting case called Balligan against Boys Sutton and Perry in 2017, in which the court explored at some length what the duty to explain actually meant. And in essence, what they're saying is as follows. If there's provision in a document that is vague or ambiguous, or there is provision that warrants use of the rules of construction, the client needs to be advised about that vagueness or ambiguity. So when I start thinking about that, I immediately look at the sort of specimen variation agreement that's been provided to us, and in particular, Clause 2. Now, to do the Law Society justice, they have said, don't take the variation agreement as gospel, don't use it as a precedent, use it as a guide or a framework. But if you look at clause two, there are provisions in there that are clearly vague or, or ambiguous. And in those circumstances, what uh, Balligan and Boyce Sutton is saying is you've got to explain to your client, look, there is one method of interpreting those provisions. This is what it is, or this is what I think it is, but I might be wrong. And the only real way of testing that provision is to litigate. And if we litigate, there are significant risks associated with that litigation. Which leads me to the first practical point to make relating to where we're deferring, where we're varying a contract. Why not think about putting some form of ADR provision or some form of mediation provision or allowing someone to uh, uh, act as arbitrator with regard to interpretation? The whole idea about the variation agreement, the whole idea about the guidance that's been given relating to lockdown seems to promote the idea of goodwill seems to promote the idea 
of sort of cooperation. And therefore, you know, to, to, to balance that against sort of the, the threat or the opportunity or possibility of litigation is a little bit uncomfortable. The next point sort of flowing on from that about the warning of litigation risk is a need to explain the process, the conveyancing process and risk associated with it. And here again, I'm thinking about deferral or use of the variation agreement. What is the position if lockdown continues? And, and again, you know, I've given up, to be honest with you, reading the press reports because, you know, you get everything from more schools are back on May the 11th to uh, pubs, clubs and nightclubs are sort of out of action till Christmas, till vulnerable people are in lockdown for the next two years. So who knows where we're going to be with regard to the lockdown ending? Um, there is the potential for it lasting a long, long time. And in those circumstances, if we have deferred or if we have used a variation agreement, there is a risk that property prices fluctuate, that client circumstances fluctuate. And therefore, what we've advised today is entirely inappropriate as time goes by and lockdown continues. I mentioned in the notes, there's no need for us to advise on commercial wisdom. But the courts have said, and the courts seem to emphasize, that that is the general rule, unless we've got commercially inexperienced clients. Well, there's no one, unless you can tell me, there's no one that's got a client sort of sitting, uh, uh, emailing them about a current transaction that's faced this type of situation in the past. It just hasn't happened. And therefore, I think there is an, a need for us to intervene to make sure that we're giving advice about commercial wisdom. More on that in a moment or two. When I started looking at this particular set of circumstances, looking at law society and government advice, and looking at this idea about transparency, communication and goodwill, I sort of harked back to the conveyancing protocol to see what was contained within the protocol to provide assistance. And it's quite interesting, when you look at the basic principles of the protocol, with reference to the fact there are many uncertainties in a conveyancing transaction, well, how true that is in the current circumstances. We can't be definitive at the beginning of the conveyancing process. Exactly. You are required to manage your client's expectations at the start and throughout the transaction. It is absolutely essential that when we're contemplating steps, which could be let's defer and let's incentivize a reluctant seller, let's enter into a variation agreement, let's as a buyer do nothing and just see what the seller does, it's important to understand that we manage our client's expectation, we communicate with them, we explain the position to them, we explain the choices that are available to them and the potential uh, circumstances surrounding from that choice. Second point from the protocol I thought is relevant, that we're bound by professional obligations throughout the transaction and we're obliged to act in the best interest of each client. And those obligations obligations with regard to acting in the best interest take precedence over the protocol. So let's just drill down a little bit with regard to that. How do we know what a client's best interests are if we don't know what their objective is? We should identify objective at the start of the transaction. We should also sort of redetermine that objective when we're deciding what we should do or what we should advise with regard to an ongoing transaction where there are choices relating to doing nothing varying contract, deferral, etc. And in addition to that, as far as client obligations are concerned, just a word of caution. I dealt with a matter a few years ago where in a similar situation, although it was in a situation relevant to a transaction rather than the market generally, um, the buyer's solicitor was attempting to assist the seller's conveyancer with regard to what the buyer's thoughts were, the client buyer's thoughts were, with regard to the particular predicament. And what he was doing was simply copying in emails that he was receiving from the client in the spirit of sort of goodwill, in the spirit of sort of attempting to communicate and attempting to be reasonable. Ultimately, there was a dispute that ended up in some high court litigation. And the High Court judge well, was severely critical, notwithstanding whether the firm had been negligent or not, severely critical of tra the transmission of emails to the seller's solicitors without the buyer's consent. 
And of course, a basic point, but the thing I'm highlighting in is this was an extraordinary sort of transaction. These are extraordinary times. And it's, you know, it, particularly when we're sitting at home, we get an email from a client explaining their predicament, we simply transmit that across to the other side. That potentially is problematical. The last point with regard to the protocol, we're under an obligation to ensure the transaction proceeds smoothly. All information is shared subject to confidentiality obligations that haven't been uh, waived. The point that I made a little earlier. As far as the duty to explain is concerned, we've got to warn of risks and dangers. What happens if the property market collapses? What happens if there are issues with regard to funding and lending? Well, we just don't know. Okay. Are we going to get anyone that's going to provide us with advice as to what the market, the property market, is likely to do when lockdown finishes? The duty to explain is dependent upon the extent to which a client appears to need advice. I think clients need more advice given the current context than they do in sort of standard times in a standard transaction. We've got to manage client expectation. And we've got to share information subject to confidentiality. The government advice is divided into sort of a number of different areas. There's advice to clients, and I've given you some detail relating to that within the notes. In essence, what that advice emphasizes is that clients should be told to stay at home. If a target property that is, the, the, is, is related to the transaction is vacant, then the traction can proceed subject to the overriding guidance relating to isolation and with regard to distancing. And the government sort of emphasizes potential problems relating to home removal. And again, this is something that uh, uh, for us as conveyances, we need to think about with regard to our clients. It's all well and good saying, right, this is a critical transaction. We've agreed that we're going to complete as per the contract. Well, that might be fine, but is it practical given the fact that there aren't removal firms that are able to deal with the practicality of home removal? If target property is occupied, government advises that we encourage deferral or use of variation agreement or combination of the two to a time when it's likely that stay-at-home measures against the virus no longer are in place. Well, again, the problem with that is that we're dealing with the unknown, aren't we? How can we give that advice? How can we encourage a client who may be arguing that this transaction is critical, that they shouldn't proceed, that we should defer, vary the contract and sit and wait? Critical home moves are exempt from the emergency enforcement powers. So if we've got a client and we're identifying objective saying this is critical and these are the reasons why, then if we take a reasoned and considered view as to why they say it's critical, if it makes sense, then there's an argument that we can proceed. Of course, in those circumstances, we need the cooperation of the other party. And again, we need to ensure that our client is aware of practicalities. So there are certain critical moves and avoidable moves where transactions can go ahead as, uh, as per contract. Um, important to understand that with regard to clients that are thinking about putting the property on the market, the government advises that unless it's critical, they ought not to be doing so. And again, what we should be saying to our clients is, look, there are things we can do to prepare with regard to a sale when lockdown uh, is released. And there may be things like voluntary registration of unregistered land, tidying up the title, taking out defective title insurance policies, etc., that may be able to be undertaken in these sort of unknown times. Public are advised by government. If contracts have been exchanged, property is currently occupied, all parties should work together to agree delay or another way of resolving the matter, which might be a withdrawal from the contractual obligations, return of the deposit and everyone back to square one. Where moving is unavoidable for contractual reasons and the parties can't reach an agreement to delay, then it's essential that people follow advice on staying away from others to minimize the spread of the virus, the sort of general position. And of course, the additional general position, anyone with symptoms should follow medical advice, which means you can't move no matter what contractually has been agreed, etc. In addition to that, in addition to this point with regard to cooperation, 
When acting for a buyer, of course, we do have to identify the position with regard to our buyer's lender and to make sure that where we've got a mortgage offer, it's going to be extended if we're going to agree to defer or delay completion. And again, as far as that is concerned, who knows what our client's employment position might be when uh, lockdown ends. And therefore, it might well be that although we have a mortgage offer that's live and valid, there are issues with regard to our client's own circumstances that mean they can't or ought not to proceed. So, as far as the government advice is concerned to clients, it's sort of fairly clear cut. There is advice to estate agents, they're required to progress sales, but to promote pa patients and clients should have terms to manage timing risks, sorry, contracts should have terms to manage timing risks. As far as conveyances are concerned, government says support sales process, make sure clients are aware of difficulty and perhaps our sort of little information sheet about some of the practical problems that we're encountering or the client could encounter might be appropriate. The sort of these are the things that we need to look out for or to be aware of. Um, we've got to support the sale of an occupied property so far as possible. So we've got to try and push them along. And again, I suppose that sort of encouragement from the government would would appear to be why we're seeing uh, auction sales continuing and uh, sort of investment properties being sold and that market showing an element of growth after the dust settled after the initial lockdown. We're obliged to make every effort to support clients who are due to complete on occupied properties in the stay-at-home period to change the date, so to, so to recommend um, deferral or and recommend use of the variation agreement. <clears throat> Important to understand that if our, we have clients who are ready to move, uh, that they shouldn't be exchanging contracts. And again, we should be prioritising clients who have uh, the coronavirus illness with regard to ensuring that they are properly protected. Um, surveyors aren't expected to carry out non-urgent surveys where there are people in residence but survey work may be possible online or carrying out urgent surveys on empty properties. Where we do have a situation that's critical, so a transaction that is proceeding um, and we haven't exchanged, then again, we do need to think about the fact that our client and surveyor or valuer may not have had the opportunity to carry out an appropriate or reasonable inspection of target property. And it might be that warranties would be required or special conditions required in the contract to give effect to the, that default, as it were, with regard to issues concerning survey or indeed client inspection. So, as far as this next slide is concerned, we've talked about most of those issues courtesy of the government advice. I've given you more details in the notes themselves. But the basic principle that all conveyances must uh, comply with is the priority or prioritizing of the health of individuals. Um, transactions involving occupied properties are subject to a number of constraints and the government's heavily encouraging de deferral. As far as uh, the deferral is concerned, clients should be encouraged to agree a deferral. And as far as that deferral is concerned, it would invariably require the use of a variation agreement where contracts have been exchanged. Police emergency powers, powers relating to isolation, powers relating to distancing, are disapplied only for critical home moves. And as I say, as far as what is a critical home move is concerned, what might be critical to you might not be critical to another. It's We've got to be careful that we're getting advice, so we're getting instructions from our client so that we can take, take a view as to whether or not a, a transaction is critical or not. Unoccupied properties, not so much of a difficulty. We are, however, able to um, deal with situations whereby if we are uh, able to transact in an occupied uh, property, that can proceed. But again, we've got to think about the government's overriding objectives relating to uh, the safety of those involved in the removal process, surveyors, valuers, etc. <clears throat> the government advice to us is that we must not be conducting transactions where it appears that we're trying uh, to avoid 
um, the guidelines and, gov and uh, re recommendations of the government and the regulations that have been imposed relating to current lockdown. So anything that we do that's against the spirit uh, as well as <coughs> the letter <coughs> excuse me, of government requirements, we've got to be careful with. And once we've given advice about deferring, then we've got to have written instructions from our client to continue to complete the contract and to complete the transaction. Instructions must be followed if legally possible. Instructions from clients must be followed if legally possible. Um, it is suggested in government, uh, guidance, in government guidance that that guidance might change and we are required to consider and check if the position is altering. Uh, finally, the thing I, I like from the government is the requirement that we use and apply common sense wherever possible. Well, that's fine, isn't it, from the perspective of a conveyancer, but sometimes clients and common sense are sort of at polar opposites, aren't they? And now I want to talk about amending contracts. And the first point to note is we've got a formula for deferring a completion date provided by a number of groups, including Law Societies, Society of Licensed Conveyances, Silex, uh, Conveyancing Association, etc. The important point, however, is that we've got a formula, we've got a variation agreement, but the emphasis is that there is um, a need to tailor what we're doing, what we're drafting, what we're agreeing to to meet the original needs, the individual needs of the client. So once again, I hark back to that point that I emphasised right at the start, what is the client's objective? As far as advice to clients are concerned, are we advising clients of the benefits and risks that are incumbent in the advice that we're giving? So do they understand that if we are using a variation agreement, then there is a risk that there's some form of dispute relating to it, that we can't predict the future and we don't know how long lockdown is likely to take and we don't know what the economic impact of lockdown is going to be, other than to say it's probably going to be negative in a sort of housing or employment context. Lenders have agreed to extend mortgage instructions for a period of three months. Again, we need to see lender requirements. They may have a requirement for uh, additional information being provided by the borrower. There may be a requirement for formal confirmation to be obtained from the lender rather than the assumption that the lender has simply agreed. The advice is that most lenders have agreed. My advice is you get specific written confirmation from lender that they are extending before any advice is, is given and before the process relating to deferral commences. <clears throat> As far as searches are concerned, the advice is that um, consideration should be given as to whether or not searches should be refreshed. Important to understand that Stuart Title has a product that can deal with searches so that this idea of refreshing a search isn't necessary. There are products available that uh, Robert and uh, Steve from Stuart Title and their staff can advise you about that means it may not be necessary to refresh searches. There are also products available where searches are undertaken but are incomplete. So again, speak to Stuart Title on that if that applies to a particular situation. Important point with, that, with regard to search providers, particularly local searches, that uh, again, there can be significant timing issues and significant omissions with regard to local search results. So do watch out for that. And a significant point that I think is often overlooked, but something very close to my heart with regard to advising residential conveyances, the guidance requires us to consider the additional costs that are likely to be incurred in managing a transaction. Now I appreciate and understand that the vast majority of us with regard to resi conveyancing will be working on the basis of uh, quotation or estimate, or will have work introduced to us on the basis of fixed fees. Remember that we can alter or revise our cost estimate as long as there is an objectively valid reason for doing so. There is an old case called Reynolds against Stone Row Brewer, old case, I think it was April 2008, it's not in the notes, not on the slide, but what was said in this case is that a client who is given an estimate of cost is entitled to rely on that estimate. 
in making a commercial decision as to whether or not to proceed with the transaction. That sort of underpins, doesn't it, the law relating to quotations and estimates. But what was said in Reynolds against Stone Royal Brewer was that it is possible for a revision of that estimate to be made if there's an objectively valid reason for doing so. Well, I can't think of a better reason, a more valid reason, than the additional work that you're going to have to do, given the lockdown, assuming that we're either deferring uh, completion or we're proceeding with a critical transaction. And therefore, we can charge additional costs. What we've got to do, however, is advise the clients that we're intending to charge additional sums before we actually do the work. So where we are giving advice about what we can do relating to a sort of contra a contractual situation or a transaction that's stalled, we can say to the client, look, these are the choices, this is what my advice is, but there is a cost implication with regard to the choices that you make and to explain to the clients what those choices are and what the likely increase in costs are as well. There is a danger that because we've given quotations, because we're getting work referred to us, that we're reluctant to charge extra for the work that we're doing. But make no bones about it, if we're talking about entering into a variation agreement, we're negotiating issues relating to deferral, we're trying to sort of circumvent the problems that we've got relating to searches, etc., we should definitely be charging. It is important to understand that where an exchange of contract has taken place, the advice is that completion should be delayed until the end of the current stay-at-home period and until the requirements relating to physical distancing have ended. Completion should be capable of being extended where government restrictions extend. And this is the thing that worries me, because just what are we committing to with regard to our client? Yes, the variation agreement contains provision for long stop, etc. But just, you know, given the circumstances, the doubts relating to the economics of the current circumstance, you know, the fact that we're going to complete or potentially commit our client to complete in six months' time when we don't know what the, eco the economy or employment situation, etc., is going to look like is potentially dangerous. Important that the variation contract needs to state that once restrictions end, there'll be a period of time to enable legal completion to take place, to enable the sort of steps that are pre-completion to be properly undertaken. That doesn't trouble me too much. We, we encounter that, of course, with regard to new build transactions on a sort of weekly basis. But it's this unknowing about the economic situation sitting behind when we're triggering completion that really does worry me. <clears throat> so. It's important, I think, that before we enter into a, a variation agreement with regard to our client, we do a number of things. We advise our client as to their choices. We need express authority from the client to enter into the variation agreement. And the client needs to understand what the variation agreement is doing and where there are potential pitfalls or problems associated with that agreement and potential litigation risk, as I mentioned in my introduction. If acting for a buyer who's buying with the assistance of a mortgage, then it's important that we check the position with regard to lender. When we're giving advice, we do need to warn our client about the fact that there are so many unknown factors relevant to the lockdown period and what happens at the end of that period when we're committing to complete on our client's behalf. Factors could be fluctuating property values, lenders' lending, lending criteria changing, mortgage offers being withdrawn. As far as property prices are concerned, I can't, I've tried to sort of work out every potential scenario, and I can't come up with a scenario where property prices are likely to increase, and therefore a buyer is likely to benefit when lockdown ends. Yes, there will be a sort of uh, a boom of sort of um, joy, etc., with regard to life generally. But how can we say with any certainty what's going to happen with regard to house prices? Important that we understand that as far as the advice is concerned, we should be setting out to the client the fact that there are so many unknown factors that we're unable to give any meaningful advice as to whether or not they should defer and utilize the variation agreement. But where clients are willing to take the risk, then in those circumstances, the variation agreement can be used. 
As far as the agreement itself is concerned, there are a number of factors that we need to be aware of, uh, some of which are obvious, the most obvious being need to comply with Section 2 of the Law Property Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1989, that in essence what we're doing is exchanging a written agreement to vary the original contract. The agreement will require execution, although it is possible to prevent contamination of the physical document, the parties are entitled to e-sign the agreement or to uh, use you as their conveyancer to sign it on, as agent on their behalf. Again, if that is the case, make, be particularly careful to make sure you've got express authority from the client and the client understands just what this variation agreement is doing. As far as the variation agreement is concerned, there will be an exchange process just as there was with the original contract and the agreement must specify that the parties don't intend to create a new contract, they are varying the existing contract and the existing contract remains in effect save insofar as it is varied by the variation agreement. The Law Society Specimen uh, Variation Agreement, or Specimen Clauses more accurately, um, can be reviewed and can be utilised where contracts have been exchanged but completion hasn't taken place. But it's a starting point and is not a document that you simply print off and get the party incomplete and then get the parties to sign. Important that when we're giving advice, when we're advising clients about the variation agreement, the fact is the clients are still entering into a contractual relationship despite goodwill, cooperation, the rosy glow sitting, uh, sitting around the use of the agreement, given the current circumstances, it is a contractual document. That it will have a significant impact potentially on the clients depending upon when completion takes place. The client should be told about the potential risks where they have exchanged, where the completion date is set and the contract isn't varied. They could find themselves significantly worse off in doing nothing, but equally they could find themselves significantly worse off if they agree to a variation. It depends. It is important that what we're telling the client about the variation agreement is confirmed to the client in writing and that there is an explanation provided to the client as to the choices that they have relating to either continuing with their existing contractual relationship, varying the original agreement, um, or coming, coming up with some other form of solution. Um, as far as the agreement itself is concerned, important to understand that the um, agreement uh, requires good faith on the part of all parties that the parties must um, accord with the provisions, duties and obligations in the, in the original contract. The delay provisions may not be relevant to the particular transaction that you're dealing with or client objective. A later date or no later date or cut off date needs to be considered carefully by the parties to reflect their circumstances and the circumstances of the transaction. As far as the agreement, Agreement is concerned, it is important that we understand that it will involve a formal exchange and that formal exchange will involve undertakings with regard to the provision of documents. So where we're getting or using e-documents rather than hard copy documents, we do need to think about the terminology that we're using relating to the contract. Additional guidance that I think is important, uh, clause three of the variation agreement. <clears throat> important that we understand as far as that is concerned um, you can agree a variation relating to it that will potentially cause some issues and um, therefore the there are alternatives relating to uh, clause three I've given you some detail in the notes the idea of clause three is that it isn't a one-size-fits-all type of clause. It will require consideration to meet demands and needs of clients. Um, if a transaction is a train transaction, we do need to think about the fact that if we're agreeing a variation agreement with provision, are other parties within the chain doing the same? If not, we potentially could create vulnerability and exposure for our clients. 
important to understand that the original contract and variation agreement do need to be considered together, in particular with regard to the serving of notices relevant to either. Um, interestingly, with regard to the standard conditions of sale fifth edition, better to utilize uh, fax as a means of service of notice rather than any other method on the basis that if you serve via fax in accordance with conditions of sale fifth edition then deem service is one hour after the fax is sent but again in the variation agreement you may want to provide some alternative notice provision and may permit for example the use of email given the circumstances important to understand with regard to the variation agreement the fact that it needs to be explained carefully to the client so that the client understands it we do need to be careful where we're dealing with a chain that what we're drafting and what we've agreed is consistent with what's been agreed up the chain and down the chain as well i now want to talk about delayed completion and what the position is assuming we haven't agreed a deferral we haven't entered into a variation agreement and the standard contractual provision applies in those circumstances a number of things firstly and interestingly if a party after exchange of contracts notifies you that their client will be unable or is unwilling to complete then technically that would enable your client to bring proceedings for specific performance I'm not for the life of me thinking that that would be appropriate or suitable in the current circumstances but generally speaking that is the case it's right to say that specific performance is not the best of remedies, it's an equitable remedy, only available at the discretion of the court, and given the current circumstances, unlikely that a court is going to exercise its discretion where there is some form of um, virus-related reason for completion not being possible or for that indication to be given by one party to the other after exchange relating to an inability to complete. The next thing to mention is that the government and guide, guidelines encourage the use of good faith and cooperation. And therefore, if we are going to attempt to enforce contractual obligations, that runs contrary to that spirit or that sort of overview. And we need to be aware of that. And of course, we don't know what the court's stance will be when issues, if issues relating to delayed completion or contractual obligations that require um, liability uh, within the lockdown period. We don't know what the court's attitude will be. The important thing I want to emphasize is that where we have a defaulting party who has or is unable to complete or has indicated that they are unwilling to complete, it is important that we advise clients, the innocent party, of their options. And their options are to serve a notice to complete, assuming uh, the day for completion, the time for completion has passed. It's also important to note that it's possible to bring proceedings for breach of contract. If we're acting for an innocent seller, it's important to understand that the likelihood is we'll be entitled to retain the deposit and claim damages. Within the notes, I mention a number of things. Firstly, the issue with regard to the uh, retention of a deposit by an innocent seller. The position is not entirely clear-cut. It's wrong to think that there is an automatic entitlement to retention of the deposit. Courts have a discretion, courtesy of Section 49 of the Law of Property Act 1925. Important to understand that it's not possible to exclude the operation of the jurisdiction of the court under Section 49. So there's always a discretion available to the court where litigation ensues as to what's to happen to the deposit. The other point to note with regard to rescission, is rescission available? Well, it may be available um, where there has been an inability to complete or non-compliance relating to completion. If we are looking at a deferred completion rather than a breach of contractual obligation relating to completion, then we can think about taking out bridging finance to enable clients to proceed. Very risky, particularly risky in the current environment. And also the guidance suggests that it may be possible to offer incentives to a reluctant seller to try and persuade the uh, seller to agree to defer. 
Before I did go any further with regard to the slides, there's something I omitted to mention with regard to the issue concerning um, the um, deposit and the position relating to deposit. Um, there's two points here. Firstly, be careful if you're dealing with any sort of critical transactions or any transactions of an occupied property where there is any attempt to avoid to to impose an obligation to pay a deposit higher than 10 percent on the basis that this could constitute a, a, a penalty pe pe meaning that the recovery of that amount would be enforceable unenforceable or the agreement being unenforceable i've seen that where when we're talking about uh, offering an incentive to a seller with regard to a deferred completion we'll pay an additional deposit or we'll pay a deposit an additional 15 percent if the variation agreement is, is is entered into and deferral agreed so do be careful with regard to that in the notes that are going to be provided for you there's lots of information related to deferred completion with regard to the law relating to um, deposits and also the law relating to standard contractual obligations. I want to touch on and go back to this issue about incentives for the seller. If we're going to increase the purchase price, if we're going to release the deposit to the seller as agent, if we're going to allow a seller to charge interest, well, is our client buyer going into this agreement with their eyes wide open? Are they happy, given the fact that we can't say when lockdown is going to occur? Is it not similar to sort of open-ended bridging? I've given you some notes relating to, notice to notices to complete. There's one important point that I want to highlight in my presentation today, and that's concerning the advice that we give to an innocent party where a defaulting party has been unable or is unwilling to complete despite being contractually obliged to do so. And that's this case called Williams against Glenowen and Company. Quite an unusual case involving the purchase of a farm. So unusual on the facts, but the court did emphasize that lawyers were negligent in failing to advise an innocent party of the availability of the service of a notice to complete. Um, the delay that ensued meant the innocent party sustained loss and the court said that their, his solicitors were liable for that loss he should have been advised the moment completion did not take place of the availability of a notice to complete now there could be circumstances where the service of a notice to complete is entirely inappropriate but it's for the client to be made aware of the choices that are available to them I've given you lots of information concerning the formalities to be contained within a notice to complete. It's all sort of fairly self-explanatory stuff. But that case, Williams against Glenowen, is quite interesting. Um, on a, a sort of slight aside, do be aware that what you can do to avoid the need to serve a notice to complete is, at exchange of contract, agree that time will be of the essence for completion. So if I was dealing with a critical transaction where it was absolutely essential that we completed on a particular date and I wanted to force the other side's hand with regard to that commitment, then I could ask that we agree that time is of the essence with regard to completion. Of course, a double-edged sword, because if my client is then unable to complete, then the other side, the innocent seller, for example, would be entitled to retain deposit, potentially. As far as remedies are concerned, I've given you within the notes lots of information relating to potential remedies for the seller and for the buyer. I've mentioned already specific performance. Again, a very brave lawyer that advised the client that they're likely to be awarded specific performance in residential conveyancing on the basis that it's equitable and it can be quite difficult for a court to um, compel a defaulting buyer who's had their mortgage offer withdrawn or their financial circumstances decimated to compel them to complete. Easier to, for a buyer to uh, seek specific performance where a seller is unable to complete, but again there's an argument about rendering the seller homeless in those circumstances. Um, rescission available courtesy of condition 7.4 of the standard conditions. And of course, claims for breach of contract either way from the innocent party against the defaulting party. I mentioned in the notes uh, and again on slide here that if we are in a situation, unfortunately, where litigation is necessary, 
Courts and tribunals are open for business as our barristers chambers. As far as some general issues where we're buying properties that are currently let, do be aware of the changes courtesy of the Coronavirus Act 2020 concerning assured tenancies, concerning other types of tenancy too, rent act tenancies and secured tenancies. Again, all the details are available for you in the notes. I want to conclude by mentioning a number of points that I think are relevant. Point number one, with regard to the conveyancing process in these difficult times, remember the sort of basic principles. One, do the simple things well. Two, make sure that you have client objective. Three, make sure that you are obtaining informed consent from your client with regard to each and every aspect of the transaction. We're working in unusual situations. If you said to me uh, four months ago, I'd be sitting in my office at the bottom of the garden doing a webinar, I would be sort of, I'd fall off the chair on the basis that nowhere in a million years is that likely to happen. You know, the fact that we're working from home uh, has some significant disadvantages. It also has major distractions. And therefore, you know, it's difficult. We don't have colleagues that we can go around and sort of have a quick chat with. But nonetheless, there is the facility, courtesy of electronics, to be able to communicate with people just as we ever did. This webinar has been um, promoted and uh, has been funded by Stuart Title. They have a myriad of products available for them, uh, which you can see at their website. Robert Kelly, who's the business development manager, is listening in today for his sins and is also available for any issues or problems that you've got relating to some of the things I've touched on or explored and some of the product availability relevant to the presentation today, but is also uh, aware across the spectrum of products that's available. And Steve, who kindly introduced me today, is also available to take questions. If anyone has any issues with regard to anything that I've said, if anyone wants, or has any questions that are too shy to pose, uh, Steve hopefully will have a little bit of time for sort of direct questions now, but I've put on this slide my email address, and you're more than welcome to fire away. We have thought about producing a sort of little bulletin after today's presentation. And if you don't mind, if you are posing questions, uh, if you wouldn't mind my sharing the response that I give and the question that's posed on the basis that the question is an anonymous question, they, those questions and those answers might, if, if we may, be incorporated into the sort of e-shot or newsletter that flows. But listen, everybody, thank you very much for being very attentive in these difficult times i hope the sort of it and the connection etc has worked and i hope you've been able to hear me i am going to loiter for questions steve if that's all right with you and genuinely yeah. if you have any questions that you want to post or uh, or generate please do so the other thing to note is that there are a series of other webinars that we're doing courtesy of Stuart title and what they've asked me to do is is to say uh, that there might be other subjects that you might be interested in presentations uh, being done for you. So uh, there, is a, there are uh, webinars that we're actually going to do that we've actually uh, scheduled, but other, other webinars that you might be interested in. I do a webinar about soft skills and clients, how to deal with difficult clients, etc. A webinar on residential leaseholds, looking at the sort of turmoil surrounding ground rents, etc. And I do a, a, a webinar called The Terrible Truth About Clients which uh, is amusing and informative, some say. But genuinely, thank you very much for listening. Um, I'll, I'll hand over to Steve. And Steve, I'm happy to deal with any questions that anyone has generated or anyone wants me to deal with. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much, Ian. Um, so yeah, I'm a bit worried that we're over, uh, just at the 12 o'clock. Um, yeah. But yeah, if anyone does have any questions, you can submit them through your question panel. Um, if anyone's feeling particularly brave, uh, you can also um, raise your hand. There's a raise hand button. I think Ian's just putting that up on the screen now. Um, <laughs> and uh, what we can do is we can unmute you if you want to ask the question live. Um, otherwise, as Ian says, uh, we will uh, respond to any questions afterwards. If you'd like to contact myself directly, uh, the email is steve.smith.stuart.com. I think if you reply 
to any of the webinar uh, information that's been sent out to you, that would come directly to my email anyway, if you uh, don't have the email address. Um, and you may say we've had a couple of questions. There's one from uh, Laura Thompson. Uh, she asked, yep. what are your views on completions taking place when there are three parties in the chain and the property at the top of the chain is unoccupied? Well, the, the issue there is, are the other transactions critical? Or are the other are any of the other properties unoccupied? Uh, I would want, depending on which, whom I'm acting for within the chain, I would want my client to confirm to me that their view is that the transaction is critical. That's assuming that we haven't exchanged. If we have exchanged, then it's essential that all parties in the chain agree a deferral or variation. Does that answer the question, Steve? If Laura wants me to sort of develop it anymore, she drops me a note by email, I'll have a look at it in detail, but that's my sort of initial view. Yes, yeah, no, that's not going, thank you. Uh, we have yeah. another question in from I think, uh, Zara. Uh, she said, yeah. what's the best way of getting through clients that really don't get it? Want to go against yeah. the government yeah. advice of so, yeah. um, Good. just because of the time of work? Yeah, great point. Um, we've all got clients that you just, you know, you can spend from now to the day you retire trying to explain and they don't get it. Um, what I would always do is say, say to the client, if I was discussing with it on the telephone or via FaceTime or whatever or Skype, look, do you understand everything I've said to you? And I'd make a note of that where the client says, yeah, I get it. And then I'd say to the client, do you have any questions or issues? Is there anything that you want to ask about? That's all you can do. I have known some firms, Zara, and what they've done is they've sent the client out a little questionnaire that basically is a little quiz that they have to fill in to show that they do get it. Now, I'm worried about that because it sounds like the people you're dealing with, are like some of the people I've dealt with over the years, if you sent a little quiz out to some of the clients I've acted for, they wouldn't have a, you wouldn't have a hope in hell of them a either completing the quiz or b getting the questions right so you're back to square one i think all you can do is protect yourself and your firm by saying to the client in an email for example i assume unless you tell me to the contrary you've read all of this email you've understood it and unless you tell me you haven't got any questions or any issues i'll assume that you're happy to proceed if you instruct me to proceed in writing is that okay, Steve? Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Ian. Um, um, we had a there question is... in. Oh, yeah, so, so thank you for the answer there. So, um, I'll just take a couple more. Um, we've got yep. uh, two more to bring. Um, so, apologies, I get the pronunciation, pronunciation wrong here, but uh, Gaia Dart uh, yep. has asked Whilst we have a duty to advise and encourage clients not to move at the moment, do we have a duty to police clients if they breach the government guidance? No. No, you don't. No, you don't. No. no. Thank you, Ian. And uh, I'll take a final question uh, for this session. As I say, if anyone wants to ask any other questions, they can ask uh, Ian and I directly after today's session. Um, and this is from Chloe. She asks, um, how best to deal with other solicitors that do not agree to any variation to the contract before exchanging to deal with corona-based inability to complete? Right, yeah. Um, difficult, difficult one. Difficult one. What I would be, where I've got a, a, a lawyer on the other side of me that doesn't get what we're trying to do, I think the only thing you can do is ask the agent to intervene. You know, I'm not a great, I'm not a, a huge fan of estate agents, but in essence, if you've got a situation where you're firmly of the view that you should be deferring or entering into the variation agreement or whatever else course of action and the other side just doesn't get it or doesn't agree then you've got to i think get the an agent to, to intervene and say hey look you know this makes sense there isn't there isn't anyone that can basically police the conveyance of the process you know you can't say it's professional misconduct uh where a firm is saying well no you know we don't want to defer we don't want to vary. We do want to proceed to exchange, or we're instructed to do do so. Yeah. So, so there there isn't there isn't a method of sort of forcing that. 
the only sort of practical thing I can think because I don't know why, but clients, if you know, if an agent says this is what we're going to do, it's amazing how frequently a client will listen to an agent as opposed to listen listen to you or I as conveyances. Yes, um, absolutely. We do see a lot, actually. Yeah, because yeah. you, you know, there's absolutely nothing you, you could do. Um, I suppose, I suppose, again, given the spirit of cooperation, you could uh, email your client and confirm that you have no objection to your client transmitting a copy of that email to the other side's client to explain you know, what the position is in the hope that they then put pressure on their lawyer to uh, adhere to what you're suggesting. But other than that, there, there, there is, it's like the protocol. You know, you, you, get, you get situations where a firm of lawyers clearly is not being protocol compliant, but there isn't any real sanction sitting behind the protocol. And the same with regard to this guidance, unfortunately, Steve. Yeah, no, sorry, you're a bit crackly at the end there, but yes, I think about that. Um, yeah. we, actually, we, had com we had a comment offline saying uh, uh, estate agents are not helping delay, they're being very pushy, which I think is that. Uh, yeah, well, the point I've been making. Yeah, I mean, they're bound to because they want commission. And the th and the thing that really 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 annoys me about resi conveyancing is I don't know why, but estate agents are sort of held in high esteem, and we are not. You know, conveyances are the sort of uh, the troublemakers who give us reasons not to complete. Estate agents are the, are the good guys on the basis that they're pushing to get us into our new home or to uh, get our house sold so that we can downsize or do whatever. Yeah, no, it's very, it's very true. Um, are there any anyway, other questions? Steve? I think that's it for now. I think there'll be some that come uh, offline and that's, we can deal with them afterwards yeah. so um just saying thank you so much uh, um, no, we've you. already got some, we've already got some nice feedback from that so really appreciate Good. you taking uh the time um just a reminder to everyone that we will be sending out a copy of the notes uh and the slides following this session and we are as ian says running uh some more sessions after today if, if you uh did if you haven't signed up already and you would like to sign up also i, I want to make clear that if you have any other of your colleagues who might be interested and by that i also mean people that uh, although it's a sensitive subject maybe furloughed or not working at the moment we are making this free to anyone universally um and and trying to support the uh, the convincing industry in any way we can with these webinars um i think all that's left for me is just to uh, uh thank ian again and then um, thank you all for attending and say have a, have a lovely day Thanks.